you ever notice there's those guns at the gun store that you just keep bumping into every time you go and you don't go home with them, but for some reason they leave a lasting memory and you think about them even after you're gone. And, and then when you walk into the gun store and you're thinking about it, sometimes you're just hoping that it's gone because it deserves a good home. It's too nice to sit in a gun store, but for some reason it's just not ended up with you, but you know, you know that on any of those visits, if it's still there, that you just might have to take it home just because you, you just feel, it's almost like you feel bad for it. Well, this is one of those guns. Let's get into it. We got the brand new 22 caliber realistic snap caps to mess around with it. It's 22 caliber and uh, it's mine. I took it home. Let's get into it. Mill Serp Garage with the model ninety nine M one, circa nineteen sixty seven. 22 long rifle, semi-auto, 9-round tubular magazine with an 18-inch micro-groove barrel. These were manufactured from 1964 to 1978. 160,000 were made, approximately. It had a sister rifle called a 989M2 that was a box magazine version. And uh, it was developed in... 1959 by Edward Edward Nicole, and this was a, uh, I think the chief designer at Marlin during that period, and uh, these were made, uh, like I said, 1959. They were introduced. If it looks like the Model 60, you wouldn't be wrong because it eventually, uh, the very next year, the Model 60 was introduced. As a cheaper version these in 1959 they actually came out walnut stocks you can tell that right away because of the uh, famous marlin bullseye they had been doing this since 1922 usually in this vintage you don't see those uh, with these types of guns but um this 1959 did come out with a with this walnut stock and man it is a beautiful stock this is one of the things that in the gun store i just couldn't uh i couldn't stop looking at and uh my subsequent research showed all of this information that it was made to emulate the m1 carbine you know and that in 1959 when these were released they were the originals they um they had the walnut stocks they had like this the screw the tapped um receivers for scope mounts it was the the model 60 the, the the model 60 came out afterwards with this grooved receiver but this one was special in that it came with a grooved receiver and a sight a specific sight that just went in those grooves and uh and it really wasn't the greatest it seemed like a cool idea when you first look at it but it actually got a lot of criticism it's going it went through a little bit of its criticism factors another another part of the criticism you know in 64 they released uh, this guy and uh from 64 to 78 they made him but in 65 to 78 is the the other one the uh, the m the 989 m2 with the with the box mag the removable magazines right part of that was if you notice what is it that's weird about this tube? It's like, yeah, it's flush down here where it kind of looks like it's like a gas port or something for like a semi-auto to emulate kind of like an M1 carbine kind of look. But what happens when you bury the tube in the stock like that? If you notice, the only part of the tube you see is I mean, literally just the connecting part here, and that's it. So what are you missing? You're missing the loading port, you know, the area where you usually... You let the tube usually hang in the end 
like this and then you just load them in and you could even use the tube one at a time to push them down you can't do that with this you have to take it completely out figure out a way to hold on to it as you load then you can't just load on the bottom you actually almost have to point it skyward to load them one at a time Ugh, you know it's i can imagine it being a pain in the neck it doesn't really bother me all that much but i can imagine when these were the norm these tube magazines that uh that would be a detriment that people like things to complain about anyway that that's certainly something to complain about um it had no bolt hold open you know what i mean so then they few years after its uh, release, they came up, actually, I think it was like 69 or something. So this is a 67. I only missed it by a couple of years that you would, you could pull the bolt handle back and push it in and it would hold open, but it wouldn't be a last round hold open. It would just be a way for you to hold it open for cleaning or something like that. And then you'd have to pull it out and let it snap forward to come forward. So it wasn't a last round hold open. And there was no way to just hit like a bolt release to make it come forward. You had to just manually pull it out. So even that wasn't good enough. So with the Model 60, um, there was a kind of like a 1022-ish button right around here. It, it, as a matter of fact, it looks exactly like the 1022. I, I wonder if they just like completely stole that from them. But um, different from the 1022, I think if you, if the bolt was locked back, it would lock back on the last round. And then if you push that, the bolt would snap forward so um the 1022 one do doesn't do that it just kind of like rocks back and forth like a locker but it doesn't really it's not really technically a bolt release where when you press it it snaps forward so this one it's kind of like very bare bones because it was early uh the early 99 type version that didn't have any of that stuff except for the it's kind of cool is it came with this uh it didn't come with the site with that proprietary site which can be like 75 100 125 bucks online forget it. i'm not buying that um i just went with this nice uh bushnell actually it's not like i went with it it's just it was just on there <laughs> this came with it so um another one of the factors that made it appealing so this is me looking at it in the gun store right you know and uh i just uh kind of like every once in a blue wound you know, you, you you find these ones that you just can't stop thinking about. What what made me hesitant about it was, um, it was this receiver that kind of looks like somehow was taken down to bare metal. Um, is it aluminum? I guess it's aluminum too. You know, it just it just didn't definitely didn't look stock. And uh, here, this this kind of uh, jumped out at me. This. NYC 18-52. So what that could mean is it's a pre-1968 gun, obviously, from 67. So it's not serial numbered. Marlin didn't serial number their guns, I don't think, until they had to in 1968. So you could look at this and you could say, okay, New York City might have had to have a serial number on everything this is electro penciled in so it could just be that the city had to have a serial number and they couldn't just have a gun unserialized so they had to just give it its own serial number but another aspect could be that there's a lot of restrictive stuff going on in new york city as far as magazine capacity that maybe even even if it's a, like this because the capacity here would be nine plus one so it's nine in the tube so the guy at the gun store said it's probably, I didn't test it, but they probably had to modify it somehow to only hold five rounds. There's a five round New York City thing. I don't know if it counts for tube magazine 22s. I think it counts for everything. So I'm looking at this tube, but I'm thinking, well, it'd be a shame if this tube was somehow modified. I didn't have any way to really check it. So that's one of the things that held me back. Well, that wasn't. The only thing either, one of the things that really was bothering me about it was that I saw its potential, but it was incredibly, horribly coked up with 22 powder residue, many, many years of leaded, crusty deposits, totally 
totally terrible. Just looking, I mean, I didn't take it apart, but just looking inside the receiver. And it's also, but what little you could see by going and looking in there because it didn't even have a hold open where you could get a good look. It was like struggling with it just to, just to look inside. You didn't even want to look. It was that bad. It looked that bad that you didn't even want to look. Um, and then, uh, well, whatever, you know, when you, uh, when you get that bug, when you fall in love with them, it's, uh, it's really, there's really nothing you can do. You just got to take them home and do whatever you can. So that's what I did. And, uh, inside, yeah, it was crusty. Gun scrubbed the crap out of it. And, uh, you know, the parts started looking better. The action that came out of it looked uh, nice. The trigger group, uh, definite improvement. The receiver, however, even after blasting the crap out of it with gun scrubber, compressed air twice, and the toothbrush all inside still needed, um, just like a good uh, you know dental hygienist, uh, toothbrush, toothbrushes and rinsing doesn't get rid of everything. And when it got that, when it gets that bad, you need you know, the care of a dental hygienist to like literally get in there and scrape everything out. Guns are the same way and had to get in there and really, uh, you know, really do some close in work, but got it really nice, got it really clean. And the results were awesome. I love the way it looks. I love the way it acts. Let's, uh, this will be the first, um, the first gun that we'll uh, actually know, because in my video for the 22 snap caps, I did put them inside a uh, Colt automatic. But this will be the first video where we're using them as demonstrating. See, this is how I do it. I, I do it straight upside down like this anyway, because when I'm at the range, I just lay it on a table. You just got to remember to make sure they're pointed forward. And I just chuck them in there like this so this will be nine right here pretty sure that's the capacity is nine plus one and it is a nice tube you know we've done this before we talked about this before you know how when you can take the tube you have the rounds in there ah that's nice when it does that and it doesn't hang up on each one and you got to struggle with it that's when you know you got a nice tube not just that that's what these guys are good for because um the aluminum it's different. I mean, it's not made for aluminum. It's not made for plastic. You know, and when you when you do that with the plastic ones, it could even be closing this tube over the rims, which just rips the plastic rims off. And it just destroys them. And then all those pieces get in here. Um, this way, oh, I'm sorry, that was eight. Let's just make sure that we do actually take uh, nine in here. Yes, we do. So, yeah, you know, with these... Make sure, you know, you got to have strict separation with your uh, live ammo, of course. See, they make these very distinctive looking. I've never seen a uh, 22 long rifle projectile that looks quite like that. So he does that on purpose. Um, and the uh, this finish, this really weird looking stained, like kind of looks like kind of like when they age those mirrors. It's like the same type of look does that on purpose because that's not something that would get on the brass whether it was dirty or whether it was clean it would never get that type of look to it you know so that's another reason why he does it to be distinctive but it's still up to you to maintain that strict separation of your workshop your workshop has to be a pristine environment when it comes to live ammo in my opinion um, you shouldn't have any live ammo around at your workshop there's no need for it um, that's what snap caps are for. Uh, the live ammunition should be in a separate area where you have your live ammunition area. And uh, when you go to the range, it doesn't really matter if you bring snap caps to the range. Uh, you're not going to really have uh, an accident. Let's say if you accidentally brought snap caps to the range, you're just going to have a failure to fires. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you don't want to be home when you're doing any kind of function testing in the workshop. And, uh, and accidentally have live ammo there. That's the sh that's where the strict separation has to take place. 
But um, if you have that type of strict separation, you're never going to have snap caps end up at the range because uh, they're being separated from your regular ammo. So the charging it, look how butter smooth this thing is too. Charging it, very smooth. Um, this, with this one, it's not going to matter if we do it fast. If we do it slow, it doesn't really matter. It's very, very smooth, functional like butter. And um, yeah, it's, uh, its performance was excellent. It uh, was accurate. It was very easy to dial in the scope. Perfect scope for it. You know, the perfect 22 scope. And uh, what's cool about this scope is that it does have graduations. It fits from 3 power to 7 power, which is kind of cool. I like that, that it's uh, adjustable like that. And, uh, yeah, it, um, it was, I'm really glad that I took it home. And uh, what's cool about it is it's uh, set up with these sling swivels. And um, if I ever, uh, if I do ever come in contact with that site, it, uh, I don't need that site. <laughs> I don't even want it. All around awesome 22 package. And the Marlin uh, Model 60 continued on for a whole bunch more years. It had a very, very happy life, you know, and uh, went through a billion incarnations somewhere around like 2020 or something. They were, they, somewhere they were like bought up by Remington, but then Remington had its own problems. They went out of business and then I don't know, someone bought what that whole company up then marlin was just kind of like reintroduced or something like that and uh but i don't know i don't think they reintroduced this rifle but it it went through a bunch of years i think it made it all the way up to 2020 i'm pretty sure um as the model 60 in various incarnations but um forgive me if you have one of those and it's your baby but for me it was these older ones that really uh, did the trick for me. I've seen a million of those Model 60s on racks in gun stores and just never pulled the trigger on them. Um, they just, that those birch stocks and just, I don't know, the way they looked, there's just something about it. The Ruger 1022 always seemed to be just a step up in quality to me, so that's just kind of like where my loyalty was. Um, but this guy, this guy turned the tables for me um, and then I understood why when I did my research, because it's that, that Model 99-ness of it was really cool. Model 99, so it, uh, even though the Model 60 came out in 60, the Model 99 hung on. It was like a more premier version of it, and it hung on for a while. So the Model 99 was made from 59 to 61, the original Model 99. Then there was a Model 99C, 62 to 78. Not really sure what the C version was, what was different about it. Um, but maybe just, you know, maybe it was like during a period where they changed the bolt hold open or something like that. You know what I mean? The Model DL, probably DL was probably a deluxe version of it from 60 to 65. There was a Model G, 99G, that was actually roll marked Glenfield on it, 60 to 65. The Glenfield thing was thrown around even with the Model 60 for a while. I mean, only the experts out there would really, you know, be knowing what's going on. Actually, I got my got my Marlin book right here that had a whole, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe we'll take a quick look at the book. And uh, the 99M1, 66, sorry, 64 to 78 some places it says 66 to 79 there's there's a couple of you know different spots but i think the marlin book had 64 to 78 for the m1 and 65 to 78 
for the 989 M2, the box magazine one. So let's uh, here. Let's get the uh, let's get the Marlin book out. We'll knock around over here for a little while. So the uh, the Marlin book is actually let me get credit here with these books. Brophy, Brophy's book, Lieutenant Colonel William S. Brophy, U.S. Air Force retired. Marlin firearms: A history of the guns and the company that made them. This is this is the book. I lost my page. Where were we with the, uh, let's go. We got to go back to the table of contents. Table of contents, model, semi automatic rifles, model 99, 308. All right, so here we're working our way there. Let's let me back up a little bit. Five, six. So here we are, the model 98. We're almost there. Here it is, the model 99. Yep. Here's some 99s. Nice. See, as much as you think, there really wasn't a... So what is the C? Here we could talk about the C. We, I mentioned it before. The 99C had a micro groove rifle barrel, and the trigger was gold-plated. I thought that the M1, oh, maybe there was no micro groove in the original release. Hmm. Yeah, maybe the original 99 didn't have the micro groove, but I'm pretty sure this one did. Here's the M1. Same tubular magazine. As the 989 and the 99C. So they see there were a couple that had this tubular magazine. It was different in that it had a handguard and an 18 inch barrel. Yes, it had the micro groove. Micro grooving was interesting with um, Marlin. Here they talk about the rear sight. Here's the M2, it's a magazine. Yeah, I think people were pissed off. In 70, there was a 100th anniversary medallion embedded into the right side of the buttstock. In 69, a new bolt, bolt hold open feature would be added. So you could lock it open, but that was it. Interesting. Yeah, then we're on into the model 60s here. The Glenfield Model 60. You see a lot of those. Those are the ones in gun stores that you always see uh, millions of the Model 60s. And uh, if you see one of these guys, you know, they're a little unique. With 160,000 made, then I wouldn't exactly consider them rare. But these days, you don't really see them all that much. And when you do, you know, prices, they get a little crazy here. 2023. Prices are going through the roof. So uh, that's the model, the Marlin Model 99 M1, circa 1967. Yep. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We got a lot of cool stuff on the way. Hang in there. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you all soon.